My name is uh, John Barter. I'm the CEO of Globsec, and it's an absolute pleasure for me to be moderating uh, this today's side event. Uh, Resilient societies restoring the value of vaccines, or maybe the belief in vaccines, and we'll come to that later. It's been a very interesting morning for myself. We started off with a defense roundtable where the issues of climate change, migration, even vaccines was discussed from a security perspective. I was listening to the Director General of the World Health Organization. A couple of takeaways. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Vaccine for some in all countries, rather than vaccine for all in some countries. Very important analysis there. I think also the information that we received that 38 vaccines are undergoing clinical trials at the moment, with the Director General of the Pharma Association making it very clear that the level of international cooperation was second to none at a level never previously achieved. We have to give the public confidence that nothing is being rushed. It is just that there is a many, many more resources being put in place than previously before. So I would, love to, I would like to welcome the speakers. I'm very pleased to have Professor Pavel Yakushka from the Slovak Infectology Society, who's the one speaker who is physically here. We Hello, are, everybody. We are all fully tested at Globsec, but masked, so not dangerous. Uh, John F. Ryan, DG Santi, Director of Public Health, is John there? Andrea Amon, European Centre for Disease Prevention. I believe you're there. Nicola Stepnuta, Member of Parliament in Romania. Nicoletta Lupi, two appointments, Member of the Executive Board, Vaccines Europe, and also President and Managing Director of MSD Europe. We have some key voices from Central Europe. Professor Yakushka, I just introduced. David Bala, Director of Digital Department, Ministry of Health, Slovakia. Jaroslav Pinkas, Chief Sanitary Inspector from Poland. Dr. Agnes Danieles, Head of Department, National Public Health Center, Hungary. And Dr. Agnes Galgotsi, Unit Lead, Department of Epidemiology and Infection Control, Hungary. So a big team of speakers to get through. So as a scene setter and the first question is, I see in two folds. It's about confidence in vaccination. A recent poll in the US showed that 27% of the people would be confident enough to have a vaccine. That is a shockingly low level. We were told today in Europe, it's slightly higher than 50%. So the question really is, what can we do to increase vaccine confidence? And we need a couple of minutes from each of you. There is a public perspective, which is basically how the public sector and how the government can deal with this to ensure that vaccines are safe. And then there is the input from the private sector about their view on what can be done. So for the first response, do we have Dr. Uh, sorry, John Ryan, are you there? Okay, Andrea Ramon, would you be our first response on this, please? As you seem ready to go on our big screen. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry. Better now? Yes, perfect. Perfect. 
Good. So um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I mean, vaccine hesitancy is a phenomenon that we are um, uh, observing and also um, uh, having on our, our activity um, uh, uh, panel since, since a while. Um, the problem is that vaccine hesitancy requires a multifaceted approach. There is not one measure that will combat vaccine hesitancy. And um, while what we have been seeing in the past years is that in particular the newer vaccines are prone to um, uh, hesitancy with probably the exception of the measles vaccine, which is an old one and has also a lot of hesitancy around it. So I have assumed that what you would like to hear is uh, the particular situation for the hopefully soon to come vaccine or for, for, for COVID, where, as you have quoted, we have already seen um, uh, polls and surveys uh, indicating that people are really having a lot of doubts. And uh, these doubts uh, particularly um, uh, relate to the safety of uh, such vaccines due to the accelerated uh, process compared to uh, the normal production of vaccines, but also to the effectiveness of such vaccines and to a risk-benefit um, uh, uh, balance. There is also a, a, a lot of mis- and disinformation going going around and uh, from our point of view um, what we are doing right now together actually with the European Medicines Agency is that we are um, uh, 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 planning for a monitoring system both for the safety of the vaccine but also for the effectiveness that should be in place as soon as the vaccines are licensed so that basically from day one um, uh, this uh, both parameters, the safety and the, the um, effectiveness can be monitored. Um, and we are setting this up uh, uh, as an independent system of public, uh, um, yeah, of public um, uh, funding so that there is no, no uh, question about uh, any, any uh, interest that can influence that. Um, I also believe it is necessary now to manage the expectations what such a vaccine can do because uh, the, um, uh, even, even um, uh, a vaccine will not automatically lead to the end of the pandemic. Um, there will still be a time where uh, uh, the measures that are now implemented may have to continue. And I think it is very important to, to, to manage these expectations so that people don't think, ah, if you have a vaccine, then everything is over. It will not be over right now. Uh, after this, and it will depend a on the effectiveness of such a vaccine, b, b on the availability, uh, and uh, uh, c on the um, property of this vaccine. You know, does it really prevent infection, or is it more likely uh, uh, to to prevent only the the, the more severe uh, disease? So, and that is something that is not not uh, known uh, uh, these days. The, the third point, uh, what needs to be done is uh, to really um, train and inform healthcare workers. From other vaccine hesitancy studies, we do know that uh, healthcare workers are the trusted persons for people that want to get vaccinated and have questions. So uh, it is important that healthcare workers uh, first of all, do believe themselves in the vaccines. I mean that uh, they feel also if they are vaccinated, they are protected, but also that they are equipped with all the information that uh, uh, they feel uh, they need to have in order to enter a dialogue with the, with, uh, the, the, the patients or clients, clients uh, that come to them and have questions. And that is all things that we can already um, uh, uh, start preparing. I think one of your questions was also regarding uh, the mandatory 
uh, uh, whether vaccines should be mandatory. And what we have seen so far is that high vaccination coverage rates have been achieved in countries where vaccines are mandatory and in countries where they're not mandatory. So basically, um, uh, from our point of view, in order to achieve a high vaccine coverage, um, uh, what we uh, uh, need is a mix of approaches and the, the uh, proportions in this mix of mandatory voluntary really depend on the context of the country. And I would stop here, um, uh, but I can expand to any questions that you might have. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And uh, obviously very clear, the health workers will be the front line and the guardians of the truth and the champions of the belief in the vaccines. So uh, thank you for that, uh, that input. So I'd just like to go to uh, uh, Nikolai Stepanuta, Member of Parliament, uh, Member of the European Parliament, if you'd like to provide your input on these first questions. First of all, thank you so much. It is an honor to be part of this highly esteemed panel. And uh, it, would be, it was really interesting to listen um, and uh, to, to hear what the ECDC had to say. We had Ms. Amon in the, in the uh, Environment Committee and Public Health, where I'm a member several times. And it was always very, very engaging and very, uh, a very strong discussion. Now, uh, what can we do in order to increase vaccines confidence in general? How, and how do we ensure that vaccines are safe? And how do we ensure that they are available? I think there's a great expectation from the public that they do become available and that Europe is among the continents and regions of the world that has it readily available before anybody else. Now, this does not have to equate with Europe first. This is not what we're proposing. Uh, we are proposing, however, that the European public is protected. And that goes through a two-pillar approach, securing the production of a sufficient quantity of vaccines in the EU through the advanced purchase agreements, which sometimes are very highly criticized, but I believe they are necessary. Let me just remind you that before the month of March of 2020, we were in a position where we discussed health policy among, you know, and others, basically. It wasn't really a European competence. There was virtually no money for it. There was no reserves. When Italy came and asked for help in February, we had to show our empty pockets. So everything that has been done since with the emergency support instrument, with uh, everything else, with the stockpiling, with the reserves, with uh, everything that we did to the civil protection mechanism. These are great policy advances that are attributable to the uh, European Union. And we should not miss the forest for the, uh, for the trees in saying that if, if an advanced purchase agreement, for instance, is imperfect, that it would be better without, not at all. I do believe that we have to work closely with the business sector and the, the producers. Public money, public rules apply. This is something that uh, we, they need to understand. I think it relates to one of the other questions. I, I'm not sure if you raised it already on how to increase uh, confidence in, in uh, vaccines and, and also a better follow-up. So Sorry? yes, absolutely. How do we it increase will confidence? It will in but let me just wrap it up. I hmm. think, for the first part, it is important that we fight uh, disinformation and, and the, the spread of fake news that we present to the public that the 2.7 billion euros that have come from the emergency support instrument of the EU is something extraordinary and something that allows for a lot of research to be conducted within Europe. And uh, we need to, to make sure through the advanced purchasing agreements that we, we support uh, vaccine production as, as soon as possible, and that we mitigate any potential clinical trial failures. It is an honor to be here at the debate. Thanks again for having me. Thank you, Nikolai. Some very good points there. I'd like to move on to Nicoletta Lupi from MSD to give the private sector view on how we increase vaccine confidence and belief. Belief that it's safe, belief that it should happen. Please. Thank you. 
So good afternoon. Thank you so much also for the promotion. I'm the general manager only of MSD Italy, not the entire Europe, but thank you so much. Mm. And uh, today uh, I'm honored to be here to speak on behalf of Vaccine Europe, a specialized vaccines group within the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, FPA, representing all the major innovative and research-based vaccine companies, as well as small and medium-sized uh, enterprises um, operating in Europe. COVID-19 is an extraordinary challenge to the global community and I'm truly honored and I thank you for this kind invitation to participate to this important debate. Also because the biopharmaceutical industry in Europe uh, wants to be part of the solution and remains committed to working collaboratively across the research and the healthcare communities utilizing our, our world leader, leading science, people and resources to tackle this outbreak. With regards to the challenges to safeguard trust in the values of vaccines in the face of anticipated mass immunization programs, the main challenges are essentially related, as it has been said before, to vaccine confidence and vaccine safety. As far as vaccine confidence is concerned, at the beginning of 2019, uh, the World Health Organization outlined a, a new five-year strategic plan highlighting the 10 biggest threats to global health and vaccine hesitancy was highlighted as one of these top 10. And the success of vaccination programs around the world depends on how many factors and vaccine confidence is one of the most critical factors. Without confidence or trust, even a well-functioning immunization program, as it has been said before, even the vaccine for COVID-19 won't be able to achieve success alone. And vaccine confidence is fragile in many countries in Europe. Vaccine hesitancy has contributed to declining vaccination uptake, leaving individuals and their families vulnerable to potentially devastating diseases and disabilities and even death in some instances. Uh, the recent examples of the measles outbreak in Europe are an example of the impact of vaccine hesitancy on health security. And we see the re-emergence of diseases for which we have very effective tools to protect ourselves from. Over the past years, we have witnessed dramatic changes in the way people around the world live, work and interact due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As many companies, of course, including MST, uh, we are, are working, many companies are working to develop safe and effective COVID-19 therapy and vaccines to help society return to a normal. We are also facing a new set of challenges in maintaining routine vaccination. And vaccination coverage have declined in the US and around the world as a result of stay-home orders, social distancing guidelines, and disruption to vaccination campaigns the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. All of this is occurring against the backdrop of increasing vaccine hesitancy, fueled by anti-vaccine content and misinformation on social media, which may impact acceptance of existing vaccines as well as of future uh, COVID-19 vaccines. If millions of people miss out on routine vaccinations, potentially devastating diseases that were once largely under, under control, may reappear and we need to work together to ensure our citizens are prepared to get vaccinated. This means we need to build confidence in EU consumers that COVID-19 vaccines work and importantly are safe. And with respect to safety, companies are engaging as public health partners to develop COVID-19 vaccine candidates. A thorough evaluation of COVID-19 vaccine safety and efficacy, in addition to a demonstration of manufacturing consistency, are paramount to these efforts, as they are to all other vaccines. While we are expediting the development timeline by conducting necessary activities simultaneously and taking on additional financial risk, we are ensuring that the same stringent criteria for safety efficacy and manufacturing consistency are met for COVID-19 vaccines. And recently, at the end of last month, nine CEOs of companies developing COVID vaccine candidates emphasized this commitment in a pledge to uphold the, the integrity of the scientific and regulatory process, 
there will be no compromise on vaccine safety, quality and efficacy. However, given the scale of expected vaccinations, numerous individuals inevitably will experience health problems in temporal proximity to vaccination by coincidence, raising questions about vaccine safety and in some instances resulting in litigation. We are confronting these challenges in an environment in which vaccine hesitancy was recognized as a threat to global health before COVID-19. Moreover, vaccines, like all medicines, are not risk-free, and rare advanced events may emerge more quickly where millions of people rapidly receive a vaccine through anticipated immunization programs. The potential volumes of claims that could arise from vaccinations during the pandemic period could challenge healthcare and legal systems and undermine public confidence in governments and all vaccines, not just COVID-19 vaccines. While we all hope that this will not happen, we need to plan for the possibility. Therefore, legislation or other legally binding measures should be adopted to address the challenges presented by global health crisis, providing for no fault, streamlined compensation systems to efficiently address claims of individuals who experience serious medical events attributable to COVID-19 vaccines, and then exemption from liability for all parties involved in vaccine development, manufacture, distribution, development, and administration of vaccines during the pandemic period. No four compensation systems are already in place in 11 member states, although not all of these schemes automatically apply to COVID. Such systems support public confidence in vaccination programs and reinforce their importance to public health. These systems should be expanded also to include COVID-19 vaccines. Nicoletta, thank you very much for that. I mean, some key points from your messages. I mean, yes, we have to build public confidence and the private sector want to be part of that. Uh, we need a vaccine which is safe. You gave a warning about the hesitancy on vaccines across the world and that old diseases could be coming back. This morning, people were linking this threat to climate change as something we have to look out for as well. So this is a much bigger circular activity which cover merit aspects. And of course, you've moved on to something which is very, very important for industry, which is how can you revisit the liability compensation team, compensation system in time of the global health crisis, recognizing that mass immunization program is also a mass risk to the developer, the suppliers, the manufacturer. All these are very important points which need to be addressed. Yeah. And the citizens, and the citizens too, they need to feel protected. Good. Thank so, you. thank you very much for that. So I would like now to move to David Bella, for, from the Director of Digital Department, Ministry of Health of Slovakia, who can give a bit of a Slovak angle on this. And of course, I've got the professor to back me up as a wingman as well. Yeah. Have we got David Bala here? Okay, Professor, would you like to say a few words? So, uh, we have uh, absolutely perfect adherence to vaccination in childhood in Slovakia. Uh, many, many years we have totally mandatory vaccination according to Russian model, mm. as uh, all post-socialistic post countries. But now we have not mandatory vaccination, only perfect organized immunization system in, for children in Slovakia. This is one big advantage. But this is not uh, the main uh, users of vaccines are not children, but adult or elderly people. And it is totally different. We had not good or a little bit uh, worse uh, system for uh, people which are adult or for elderly. And uh, adherence to vaccination for uh, adults in Slovakia, for example, common vaccination purchases tetanus is much more lower than for children. And uh, for example, adherence to vaccination against flu in Slovakia is only 5%, or a little bit less than 5%. This is a disaster for me because we had uh, five, six, ten years ago uh, approximately 15%. So this is one question, how to improve. 
much more question because uh, influenza we had uh, uh, H1N1 uh, flu uh, 10 or 11 years ago with practically the same mortality because Slovakia is uh, counted with the lowest mortality across Europe for COVID-19, less than uh, uh, 15 patients per 1 million citizens and people don't see the disaster of disease. Only in the last few days, because we had a rapid increase of a uh, number of infected patients. So, but still, uh, we have very good organized zone antivax lobby, yes, which have uh, some question, which is addressed, okay, for example, AstraZeneca. Okay, the vaccination is addressed for people which are elderly, more than 70 or more than 80 years, but the clinical trials is only for people until 65 years. Good question. Yes, the little bit different situation with uh, other pharmaceutical companies or other providers, but still the basic question. Second, we don't have data in many uh, uh, corporations which uh, are involved in uh, vaccine production in childhood, in clinical trials, in third phase of clinical trials. So, and uh, the question, next question is, okay, as I was proposed, is not end of COVID-19. This is the principal question, is only some of solution, how to improve life of uh, general population with COVID-19? This is the basic question for many people. And this must be very closely and very addressly uh, for people, uh, for people uh, interpret it. Okay, the next, the next question is, uh, we have a lot of mathematic model, how to finish the end of epidemic. Uh, so named Monte Carlo simulation, we have more than 50 million uh, modulation of this system. And the uh, problem is that vaccination cover only 100,000 of them. And this is, this is the big problem for, for general population because this is really not end of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the next unanswered question is how many percent of general population must be vaccinated for uh, immunity for all. Yes, uh, public immunity or herd immunity is some authors say that 70%, some that 50%, some that uh, 80%. We have different mathematic models and we have this is unanswered question. Safety, tolerability of vaccine, and efficacy is the basic, the basic question. And we have some preliminary data of uh, uh, second, uh, final data of second phase of trial and preliminary data of third phase of trial, uh, which we have good uh, production of antibodies. In many cases, the uh, level of antibodies are higher than after a slightly common COVID-19 disease. And we have good data about memory uh, immune answer, which is much more important. Uh, but still, uh, still, we don't have uh, good communicate preliminary data of third phase for general population. This is basic question. For example, AstraZeneca had one uh, severe adverse event, and this adverse event was very perfect communicated in a general newspaper. But preliminary data of third phase, how to improve this vaccination uh, immune answer, antibody productions, and for example, memory cells, which is much more important, it is practically uncommunicated for general publication, not for experts, because we have meeting and we have data. But some of people ask me, how is possible that we will have, for example, in US uh, market in end of November and uh, in December uh, vaccine market, but we still don't have data how efficacy is vaccine, how safety is vaccine, and this is not good communicating. This is the principal question. And next one is that we have more providers with different construction of vaccines. This is very uh, sexy for experts, but general population asked which vaccine is the best. 
And this is this is bad construction of answer or question. Answer is easy. All vaccines which cover more than 70% of population and which is safety and which is efficacy is perfect for using for country. And we have big uh, price differences, for example, between AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, which is adenovirus constructed vaccine and mRNA vaccine. This is, this is big unanswered question, which are sometimes communicated in newspaper, but the data from clinical trials are uncommunicated. The last question we must communicate for the general population, mainly for elderly patients and for adult patients, uh, we have one very good example in Slovakia. In the uh, start of 19th century, the mean duration of life in Slovakia, in men, we don't have data uh, about women, was 51 years. Now it's very short, uh, in, uh, in contrast with, for example, other European countries, only 74 years or 72 years. We add 22 years, yes? And 12 of these 22 years was, were added according vaccination and according antibiotic therapy. Only less than one half of these added years was according, were according, sorry, uh, 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 treatment of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, oncologic disease, transplant program, etc., psychiatric disorders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And probably we lose this advantage because we have two big hurdles for next years, for next 10 years or 20 years, 12 years, 20 years, sorry. And this is vaccination and antibiotic resistance. Vaccination is absolutely perfect tool how to overcome the hurdle with antimicrobial resistance, which will be one of big issue in medicine in the next 30 years. Yes, this is absolutely, absolutely unrecognized for some governments, some uh, public health authorities, etc., etc. And we must uh, uh, explain for general population, for stakeholders, for governments, that this is only start how to overcome the hurdle with infectious diseases, not only for next one, two, three years, but for 10 years, for decades, two, three, four, next decades. Professor, thank you very much. I mean, a lot to take from that. The experts understand it. Yes. It's easy to communicate among experts. It's really challenging to communicate across the population with so many different types of vaccines being yes, produced absolutely. for COVID, yeah? But there is proof, there is evidence that vaccination has contributed to extended life, even in Slovakia. Yes. And, the, and we must go back to the basics and communicate this across the region. Now we need to go to Poland and we need to go to Hungary because we've got some other speakers there. So I'm looking for Jaroslav Pinkaus, Chief Sanitary Inspector of Poland. Are you there? Yeah. Yes. No, unfortunately not. Uh, this is Paweł Avramczyk, the director of, of Department of uh, Antibiological Measures as well as uh, Border Sanitary Protection. I'd like to excuse my chief due to very important uh, situation, very serious situation which emerged in Poland uh, today. On behalf of Mr. Professor Jaroslaw Pinkas, I'd like to give you a picture of our vaccination policy in Poland. Uh, Poland has a robust system of, by the way, could you hear me or not? Very well. Poland has a robust system of immunization. Uh, every year by the 31 October, Chief Sanitary Inspector, which is the Chief of Sanitary Inspection in Poland, announces in the official journal of the Minister of Health communicate on the immunization schedule for the next year. Uh, Communic encompasses all sorts of vaccination programs, not only that mandatory and free of charge, but also that which are recommended for specific groups of people or professionals. It contains detailed indicators, indications regarding the use of individual vaccines and uh, also recommendation resulting from the current epidemiological situation. 
main part of immunization activities in Poland is based on the, our national immunization program, which includes prophylactic vaccination against 13 infectious diseases for children. Uh, and also national immunization program includes also post-exposure prophyl prophylaxis for adults in a case of exposition to tetanus, rabies, or diphtheria. Uh, if we're talking about prophylactic uh, vaccination for children, I'd like to stress that those uh, vaccination prophylactic program includes vaccination against tuberculosis, hepatitis B, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, poliomyelitis, hemophilus influenza type B, streptococcus pneumonia, mumps, measles, uh, and uh, rubella. It is planned to introduce in program for 2022 vaccination against rotavirus, and this brand new idea to implement those anti-rotavirus uh, vaccine uh, in case of uh, children vaccination. Uh, also cases of diphtheria, tetanus and polymyelitis, measles and and viral hepatitis for the population age 35. Uh, well, in those, uh, our efforts, we decrease uh, annual number of incidence of rubella, mumps, invasive hemophilus influenza, uh, B infections. Uh, population immunity is uh, possible in relation to those diseases in which the source of infection is only a sick person during the infectious period. There is no uh, animal or environmental pathogen reservoir. Uh, if we are also talking about the uh, chief sanitary inspector, the measures or activities, the chief sanitary inspector also announces in the form of the message in the official journal of the Minister of Health, the immunization schedule uh, for a given year with detailed indications regarding the use of individual vaccines resulting from the current epidemiological situation by, as I said, the, the, the 31 October of the year preceding the implementation of this schedule. Vaccines, what is important, are procured every year by the Minister of Health and distributed by local units of the state sanitary inspection, which is, by the way, the public health authority, to general practitioners. Vaccines are administered by general practitioners in over 10,000 practices contracted by National Health Fund. These vaccinations are mandatory and free of charge, as I said. Due to effective system of vaccination purchase, distribution and administration vaccination coverage across the country for many, many years was a high as 95 up to 99%. Apart from, unfortunately, the vaccination against uh, Influenza on this area, unfortunately, every year we reach not more than 4.5% uh, in uh, our, among our population. Yet in recent years, substantial drop in coverage is observed and it can be attributed to the anti-vaccination movement. By the way, uh, when we are talking about anti-vaccination movement, there is a huge challenge in front of us means the public health authority due to increasing activity of this anti-vaccination movement. And one of the idea, of course, in the frame of, of uh, improving the liability and trust uh, to the vaccine is some particular idea which was started one year ago in Poland. Many, many parents refuse the vaccination of uh, their child, uh, giving the, the evidence that their child suffers from different chronic diseases or present the lack of uh, immunity, the, the, the sufficient immunity. In order to uh, contain uh, this uh, problem, we decided to establish, to design a special medical center which could uh, design or plan a special individual vaccination program for each particular child uh, 
which could take into account the health status of this particular child. Uh, national immunization program is supplemented by two additional programs. First of these supplement programs is dedicated for influenza. Older people above uh, 75 years are offered vaccination completely free uh, of charge. And there is also the 50% uh, reimbursement for older people between 65 up to 75, pregnant women and three to five years children. The program is at the early stage of implementation, implementation and it is impossible to e evaluate number of people vaccinated at this particular moment now. We are also waiting for the new lots of influenza vaccine on the present season, current season, which are scheduled for October and November. Uh, second supplemental program includes so-called uh, recommendation vaccination. If general practitioners prescribe vaccine patient has to pay for it full price, but its administration is free of charge. Main vaccination which are carried on in that way includes uh, booster prophylactic vaccination for adults against pertussis and tetan or tetanus. Currently, only medical doctors are eligible to qualify patients for vaccination, but there is ongoing discussion to authorize nurses to qualify adults for influenza vaccination. It is important also in the view of uh, future COVID-19 mass vaccination campaign. At that moment, that is all what I'd like to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pavel. I really appreciated the explanation about the Polish mandatory testing scheme. I used to be in the British military, so everything was mandatory, so it was absolutely fine. But what I'm seeing is a difference between, let's say, the communication in the UK and the communication in Central Eastern Europe. So in Central Eastern Europe, I believe the governments are able to communicate in a manner which is simple, which the public believe. And I believe that if the public believe, they are comfortable with mandatory vaccination. Yeah. If the government is not clear, then people will be uncomfortable. And this is the opening to the anti-vax lobby. So thank you very, very much for the point. And we must now move to Hungary. We would like the Hungarian take on it. And then we're going to start moving to some of the financial aspects about if Central Europe can actually, how are they going to afford this with their current health funding. But moving to Hungary, first of all, we have Dr. Agnes Daniles, Head of Department, National Public Health Centre, Hungary. Very much like the Hungarian take on it. I've got two of you there. All right, good. We've got a gang. Yes. Please unmute yourself. Uh, can you unmute? Because of course we would like to hear you. <laughs> yes, so it's okay. Right. We, we okay, thank you very much. So we are here together from the National Public Health Center uh, of Hungary. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to take part of this discussion. And uh, first, um, some words about um, Hungary in, spa in uh, about the national vaccination program. So we had a, a mandatory vaccination program in Hungary, and it is, uh, I think, for decades, it's really uh, successful. The vaccine coverages um, in the mandatory vac uh, vaccines above 99% in every year. But uh, I have to say that uh, as uh, Slovakia, we are facing problems uh, with the vaccination uptake in the in seasonal influenza vaccine. So every year we have uh, 1.3 million doses free of charge uh, vaccines for the risk groups. But uh, I have to say that uh, only the 50% of these uh, vaccines are used. And uh, I have to say that the, um, especially the healthcare providers are refuses uh, the vaccine. So if, uh, if they are not believe in the, in the importance of the influenza vaccine, they won't inform the, the population about this. Uh, uh, so they won't uh, provide them or they don't, do not recommend them to get uh, vaccinated against influenza. 
So I think the public has, uh, authority has an important role for the information of the healthcare providers and of course the clear and transparent information for the public. And uh, I think this uh, information provides will, um, won't be too scientific. Uh, it's, I think we have to use general language for them to understand the effectiveness and the safety of the uh, new vaccination, especially on COVID-19 vaccine, uh, to, to achieve uh, 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 high coverage. Uh, of the uptake. And uh, I think uh, it is very important that the population has to uh, confidence in the government and the authorities as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that. And that, that was extremely clear. I think if we just stick with Central Eastern Europe for a bit, because I think we've got a challenge here. Ferdy here <laughs> from the Netherlands, they spend 30% of their government budget on healthcare. And in Slovakia, I believe it's 5%. So Which in France, six. Oh, um, I apologize. Much more close it's, six. It's, six, it's 6%, okay? But these devils in Netherlands are spending 30%. Now the question is, how are we going to prioritize the government spending to actually afford this vaccination for our Slovak population? And maybe there are similar cases in Hungary and Poland to consider. So this is another angle we need to look at. Professor, please. Yes, the question is that uh, many, many years our health system was much more oriented to chronic disease, the cardiovascular, oncologic disease, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is how to communicate for general population because mandatory vaccination, we had to uh, go to uh, habits from uh, 30 years ago when we, was part, when we were part of a post-socialistic blog and this was uh, Mandatory, mandatory, and mandatory. All uh, vaccines were, were mandatory. Now we have a little bit of a different situation and uh, much more important is communication and how to spend this money very rationally. Uh, my wife is naturally Hungarian speaking and uh, uh, we have uh, very close to Czech Republic and uh, very close to, Pol to Poland and to the system in our countries is very similar. We have very good access to uh, some drugs, but it's limited for new drugs, very expensive drugs, and uh, especially we have some uh, higher reimbursement in some drugs uh, than in comparable countries in Western Europe. This is the first situation. Second, our buildings, this is disasters, our hospitals, our outpatient department, uh, only some were removed, for example, in uh, this uh, COVID-19 epidemic, uh, we recognize one problem and this is uh, oxygen access in hospital for high flow and for uh, ventilation, which is not good, uh, uh, not good uh, uh, developed in the uh, last uh, decades. And the next problem is that uh, uh, our uh, best physician moved to Western Europe, to UK, to Holland, to Germany, yes, or from Slovakia to Czech Republic, but not to, uh, not to uh, only 65% or 60% of uh, uh, young doctors stay in Slovakia. And this is, this is not good. And uh, the, problem, the problem with vaccination is that we have two words, mandatory and voluntary. Yes, mm -hmm. we see in, for example, in childhood. In my country is vaccination against rotavirus voluntary. Only 20% children are vaccinated against rotavirus. Between 95 and 99% of uh, children are vaccinated uh, with mandatory vaccines. It is good, but we have some problem. The same is probably in Hungary. This is uh, special population, which is Roma population. It's uh, a very low utilization of vaccine, not due to anti-vax, but due to poor medical literacy. Yes, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the next problem, we don't have vaccination campaign for many years. Yes, and which is 
order of this vaccination campaign. This government, it is state, it is public health authorities. In our world, is the same public health authorities, government, and state, but it is not the same. Yes, when we have press conference together, the uh, chief officer of public health system in Slovakia and prime minister, and they are the same acceptance between people. But this is two different worlds. Yes, public health authorities must address the public health problems for general population. The point of view of politicians is a little bit different. Yeah. Yes, and but for our people is the same. Yes, mm -hmm. this is state, government oriented, et cetera, et cetera. The second problem is that we don't have campaign organized by NGO, sometimes by pharmaceutical companies, but these private sector are oriented only for vaccination with, uh, which are not fully reimbursed in my country. Yes, this is permitted only. Yes, and we don't have uh, involved in campaign, for example, sportsmen, actors, and many other uh, professions, professionals which are much more accepted by general population. And we must not improve, construct vaccination campaign for COVID-19 vaccination on totally different principles, not only state-based, by NGO-based and public authorities-based, which is very important tool for improve adherence of general population for vaccination coverage. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Professor. And that has just given us a great link I believe, back to uh, Andrea Ramon at the European Centre for Disease, Pre Disease Prevention, because this morning on the health panel, it was made clear that there was a great belief that Angela Merkel, the reason Germany did very well was they listened to the scientists, yeah, rather than the politicians, yeah. And I think we did something similar in Slovakia, and I'm def definitely listening to the professor. But I would like to go back to the uh, European Center for Disease Prevention to raise, have another short discussion on mandatory, because it's clear that in the Central European countries, there still seems to be a passion and a belief in this. So maybe we could have a few more points from you on that. Andrea, can you unmute? So I, I can actually not say much more than I said before, because it is indeed um, uh, not that mandatory vaccination will automatically lead to high coverage. It really lead, um, depends on the societal context. There are um, uh, um, representatives from member states that tell us, well, if we would make this mandatory in our country, it would have uh, the, the, a, a, a counter effect. So there are also countries that have high vaccination coverages uh, without mandatory, with voluntary, with, uh, with information campaigns, with uh, making access easy to the, uh, to the vaccine and people take the vaccine. So I, I think uh, it's really um, uh, is important that um, in, uh, it, it uh, is a good decision in the country or a good knowledge in the country what works and then offer opportunities so that the, uh, that what works can really uh, be optimized. And um, uh, it's, it's uh, very clear to us when we were working with vaccine hesitancy, we had, um, you know, material uh, that we have produced, uh, and we try to translate it. But uh, it, translation is not sufficient. It has to be adapted at the national context, and sometimes even at the local context. So um, there is no no one way that and one size that really fits all here. Okay. Thank you very much for that. What is clear to me, and people talked about the NGO sector, private public platform, is that GlobSec is going to have to take a role with our Health Lighthouse project to bring together so many experts we can now access to look at how we can communicate. We are already combating disinformation across Central Eastern Europe as part of our bread and butter, so we now need to look at the health elements of this. I think there's two more elements we want to go back to, and I'm looking at going to MSD to Nicoletta on this one, 
because there is a question about what could be the role of European actors in the provision of a seamless guidance on sustainable immunization financing, which is something which I think we should touch on. And then to wrap up, I would like to focus on how the current vaccine ecosystem can be improved, which I believe is what we need to focus on before we wrap up the, date, the debate. So Nicoletta, please over to your, yourself for a few minutes. Thank you. So let me start from the vac current vaccine ecosystems. How could they be improved uh, to become more resilient in tackling this and possibly also future crisis? Uh, I think that COVID-19 has taught us how important it is to work together first. Uh, so to prioritize health and show global solidarity. The pandemic unveiled the weaknesses of our systems and generated the right emphasis on the need to build resilient health systems to protect human life and produce good health outcomes for all during the crisis and its aftermath. Um, European Commission has done a good job in uh, to support research, development and manufacturing scale up of COVID-19 vaccines. The European Parliament has been instrumental in calling for European solidarity and pandemic preparedness and has been at the forefront of proposing COVID-19 policy solution. Moreover, Commission President von der Leyen in her State of Union speech to the European Parliament three weeks ago called for a stronger European health union and for creating a European version of the US Biomedical Advanced Research and uh, Development Authority, BARDA. This is very good news for the future of European pandemic preparedness and something that should be strongly supported. Efficient healthcare systems are a prerequisite for successful crisis management, including pandemics. At the member states level, governments need to consider prioritization and increased investments in our care systems to strengthen the community health services, epidemiologic surveillance and emergency preparedness. This will make health care systems more resilient and better respons responsive to crisis. If I had to list from my experience uh, of one country in Europe, uh, what could be the recommendations for how poly policymakers can have the greatest impact also with respect you know, to increase vaccine uh, confidence, but also taking into, ac into account the modernization of the sanitary systems. I would definitely um, quote the, to engage directly uh, with communities, with officials and experts, First of all, to understand hesitancy, its impact on vaccination and public health and what can be done about it. Then to invest in immunization system infrastructure to anticipate and manage issues related to vaccines hesitancy. Then I would say to activate a broad set of actors within and beyond the health systems to reach communities and individuals more effectively and demonstrate the broad support for vaccination to develop national strategies. I fully agree it has to be also a national strategy mirroring what is needed country by country while strengthening capabilities of healthcare workers to increase confidence in vaccination, mobilize also the private sector and other stakeholders involved in digital media to address misinformation and promote the dissemination of availability and accurate information and at last to develop and implement policies that could really increase uh, public confidence in, in vaccination. Having, having said that, I think that uh, uh, once working on, um, on uh, resilience, uh, it is important that we don't work only on the resilience for the emergency, but really we have to work on the resilience also for the normal uh, medical activity so that no other diseases are left behind. And of course, we have to ensure that we can preserve also the resilience of the company because companies should be ready uh, for the next emergency, for the next pandemic as we are today in order to invest in immediately, all of a sudden more and to ensure that there is going to be a solution, to be part of the solution for such an important, not only, um, crisis from a from a scientific point of view but also from a societal and from an economic point of view 
And of course, uh, we are um, fully, um, fully committed to ensure also equitable access across the globe. And surely timely and simultaneously access in the EU will require that national authorities work together on a building a joint up vaccination strategy. And our focus is on discovering and developing safe and effective vaccines and manufacturing these in cooperation to meet the numbers of doses that are required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Very, very clear points from you. And I think I'd just like to go back to, if I could, Nikolai from the, the Member of Parliament, uh, the European Parliament, because obviously there's a big question on pushing European leadership to, to really take a leading role here. And so if we can go back to our Romanian MEP, that would be very helpful. Nikolai, are you still there? Okay, I lost it. All right. So, uh, I think on the subject, and I, I think, is there an opportunity to ask the audience questions or not? Questions? Um, no, Mr. Not. Okay, if I, if I look, start to wrap up some key points and then ask each of you to make some final remarks. I think it's not necessarily a CE thing, but I think where health literacy is low, mandatory must be a way forward. And I could see that for areas in the UK even, to be quite honest. Uh, and I think that there is no doubt about it that a regime of mandatory uh, vaccination as part of the culture, I can only see as positive. But obviously, in other societies, it is very difficult to go back to it. Maybe in Central Eastern Europe, we have a very strong base. What I do passionately believe, and this I believe is a warning, I feel that we have to get it right with our reaction to COVID-19. Because from everything I hear on the, the role of climate change, migration, things could get a lot worse unless we get this one right. We have to put in the structures. We have to put in the processes. We have to make our public believe. We have to rely on the experts. We cannot rely on the politicians. The politicians we do need to rely on them to listen to the, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> the experts and actually let the experts do their job. That is the only way we can move forward. And as a Russian once told me, a pessimist is just a well-informed optimist. Yeah. And it is actually with that information, you actually start to say, we have to get this right to move forward. So I'd very much like to go round for some final remarks. I think, Professor, as you're next to me, are you ready for a two minute final session? Okay, my two minutes, uh, uh, we are before a big challenge. This is vaccination against COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is challenge for change our vaccination habits from mandatory vaccination in Central European countries, because all of you are from Central European countries, to voluntary vaccination, but boot covered by uh, uh, vaccination campaign addressed by health authorities, from scientists, from public respected authorities, followed only, only followed by politicians, not directed by politicians. This is very important for future. Next one is uh, we must fight uh, with uh, health literacy of our people. We must improve health literacy, not only uh, in fight with COVID-19, but for better acceptance of vaccination for flu, for pneumococci, uh, for shingles, for example, the coverage of the vaccine against shingles in uh, Central Europe is the worst in the world. Yes, and uh, this is very, very important vaccine against uh, some really huge problems. Yes, such as pain, such as complications, such as stroke, for example. Yes, we must explain not only uh, direct uh, advantage of vaccination, but this direct 
or indirect advantage of vaccination too. And the final remarks is that miss, we must have perfect net organized by European authorities in European uh, central uh, place, but followed by national programs which are competitive and which are uh, very affordable for national uh, nationalities. Thank you, Professor. Let's pop back to Hungary for a final, final take from them. That'll be the top yes. right <laughs> So thank you very much uh, again. And uh, so I, um, I agree with the Slovakian partners that, that we are facing uh, with a, a big challenge. And I think the success of the vaccination campaign is uh, really depends on how we can handle the pandemic situation and how the the, the population um, accept uh, and uh, uh, the the perception of the population about the handle of the pandemic the the measures uh, we take the public health authorities communication so the success of the vaccination campaign i think it really depends on it e Thank you. Thank you very much. And now over to uh, Pavel in Poland. A quick few final words. Yes, as I write in the chat, uh, I think that increasing the health literacy among our society, our citizens, and one of the crucial factor, absolutely, to increasing the, the level of the awareness, how the vaccines are importance in the, uh, let's say, the, the, the process, how to improve our health status in general. And what I'd like to say in, as a summary also, again, the anti-vaccination movement, it is the, uh, one of the most uh, challenging subject in present times. By the way, what uh, strike me very, uh, very, we, absolutely, uh, the vaccination uh, movements use exactly, almost exactly the same uh, or present the same way of thinking like those group of people who deny the COVID virus and the current pandemic. The same story, uh, the same way of thinking, the same, uh, uh, sentences released to the public, especially in the social media. Right, the social media is the other crucial factor in our work. Thank you very much for your uh, input and for those so important uh, uh, activities. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Barbara. That was very clear. And in fact, at one stage, I was at a discussion last year where the anti-vaccine movement was linked to hybrid warfare as part of a disinformation campaign to weaken the bedrock of societies and make them more vulnerable. So it is a real measure. So I'm glad you put that on the table. So we must pop back to the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Andrea, a few more words from you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, we believe that the vaccine will be an important tool uh, uh, for, uh, for our, in our toolbox for um, uh, co controlling the pandemic, uh, but it will not automatically end the pandemic. I think that we have uh, is an is expectation that we have to manage. Um, we also have to give uh, access access to correct information. And um, I didn't mention this before, but we have launched a European uh, 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 vaccination information portal together with the uh, uh, European Commission and the Medicines Agency in April. And we will populate this uh, portal with information, of course, also to COVID vaccines as soon as they become available. Uh, so uh, the other part is that we have to support and strengthen the healthcare workers but because they will be crucial in uh, making sure that people gain uh, confidence into the vaccine. That is also necessary uh, to um, put safety and effectiveness monitoring in place uh, and be transparent about it. So saying that because these are the main concerns of people right now and we have 
have to make sure that uh, people uh, are aware that these are co these concerns are taken seriously and um, uh, acted upon. In that sense, we are working actually with the national uh, inform uh, immunization technical advisory groups, the NITAX, uh, to prepare campaigns and also to uh, see um, uh, how how uh, national approaches can be can be um, uh, developed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I mean, it is it is very clear and. Uh, the comment I would make, you said that the vaccine, getting a vaccine was not the end of it. We've had a polio vaccine for 40 years. Uh, so just something to reflect on, <laughs> yeah? Okay, so to wrap up, um, Nicola, MSD, uh, please, on either of your roles, a few minutes from you. Thank you. Uh, so um, also from uh, Vaccine Europe, uh, I can say that COVID-19 impacts us all. Successful development of vaccines is probably our best chance to end or at least to mitigate the, the impact in the near term and uh, to solve the situation in the longer term. We have been working around the clock to develop vaccines that once approved will be available for people around the world to end this crisis. We are all going to be uh, responsible for the next, for the health of the next generations. And I dream a future where evidence-based medicine is going to be the base of all decisions and a future that is going to be possibly free from prejudice, uh, especially between private and public, because life is never enough. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'd just like to wrap up the session to thank all the speakers for an amazing range of discussion with, I think, significant depth and certainly no political spin. Uh, I am delighted there's a key message about our health workers who will be at the front line and them to have to be the believers. Uh, obviously a robust immunization plan, a belief in the vaccine, a vaccine that is safe and obviously a responsibility to communicate this. We will be taking the takeaways from this session. We have recorded it. We will be producing an output and a potential policy paper and we will be contacting the key participants to get your comments on it and we would like to start this journey with you because actually this should be the starting point the next globsec forum is on the third and fourth of june and by then we need to have done something to move forward on this we are finishing two minutes early i hope i don't have to apologize for that thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Right. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye.